In episode 49 of the Mindfulness and Grief podcast, bereaved father Eric Hodgson shares tips for going beyond just surviving loss and discusses his grief memoir, A Sherpa Named Zoe, How to Walk Through Grief and Live with Intention. The Mindfulness and Grief Podcast is brought to you by Awaken, my meditation for grief program that helps you cope with the heartache and pain of loss with mindfulness-based practices for your body, mind, and spirit. Join Awaken to participate in weekly meditation for grief groups. Access the complete mindfulness and grief course library that features guided meditations and streaming video and connect with people who understand what you're going through in our live sessions. Grief is hard enough. You don't have to do it alone. Learn more and join the community at meditationforgrief.com. I am your host, Heather Stang, author of Mindfulness and Grief and the guided journal From Grief to Peace. If you find this podcast helpful, please click on the subscribe button so you'll be notified of future episodes and leave a review so other people can find the Mindfulness and Grief podcast and benefit from the teachings. Eric Hodgson is a coach, author, speaker, and Zoe's dad. After losing his 15-year-old daughter Zoe to suicide in early 2014, Eric found a way to get back up, and through his grief journey, he is sharing the lessons he learned so that no one else has to walk alone on their journey. Eric has trained thousands of people who simply wanted to know how to navigate the worst setbacks that can happen to us all. Today on the Mindfulness and Grief podcast, we welcome Eric Hodgson, who is the author and speaker and soon to be you have a new course coming out correct yes i do Uh, which i'm actually excited about i read about it on your on your website and i think once people listen to you they will probably learn that you are someone who and this is for me reading the book we've never met before but i've read Mm -hmm. your book And I feel like you're someone who inspires hope in times of great crisis. So let's just start off by talking about probably one of the most difficult days of your life. Can you talk to us about about what happened and your daughter, Zoe? Absolutely. Thank you so much as well, uh, Heather. I know, um, you know, this may be hard for people to hear just because, uh, you know, death can take so many different forms in our lives. And uh, but there's sometimes when a loss it happens that you just don't expect it to. And and um, <clears throat> I was uh, working with Zoe, my 15 year old daughter, Zoe. She was struggling. She'd been in hospitals and she had been uh, in and out of uh, inpatient units. But she was able to step down to a group home. And she was able to come home and stay with me on weekends. And we would have so much fun on those weekends because we would go to the beach and we would freeze our hands because we'd be collecting rocks in the middle of the winter. Uh, Or Zoe would be upstairs in her room listening to some music, burning her favorite jasmine incense or playing her ukulele. Uh, And other times on those weekends, we would uh, go to the mug and muffin for breakfast on Sunday morning and just chow down and just had a a wonderful time. Of course, we came back to the house and just chilled out for the rest of the day, but that was just what weekends were like. And so um, this one particular weekend, I pick up Zoe and we're back in my house and she's upstairs in her room listening to some music. And she was applying this really cool henna tattoo on her hand that had a sun design on it. And I went upstairs to see if she wanted to go and do something with her friends. I'm like, hey, Zozo, you want to call some of your friends? And she's like, I don't really have any friends, Dad. And I'm like, I, okay, I, I know you do, but I get it. But how about we make something to eat? Is that cool? She's like, yeah, that's cool. So afterwards, we were cleaning up, and she said, I'm really tired, Dad. I'm going to go to bed now. Like, I love you, pumpkins. I love you too, Dad. 
I'm back at my computer doing some work for a little while and I go upstairs to say goodnight and I open Zoe's bedroom door and I hear Jonathan Frusciante's guitar on the stereo and there's a string of Christmas lights that are lit around the perimeter of her room, but she's not in her bed. And in the corner of my eye and in the dim light, I can see that she's standing in her closet and I am so sure that she's just about to jump out and scare me. And I said, Zoe, what are you doing? But she didn't answer me because she wasn't standing in her closet. I called 911 and I entered a, a fog. Um, bits and pieces of that night were are still blurry. Um, I walked into the hospital that night expecting to comfort her and talk with her and to let her know it's going to be okay and that we'll figure this out. But instead, I was met at the door by the ER doctor who said we did everything we could, but we couldn't save her. And that began my journey. Um, I think I wandered the halls of the hospital for close to an hour. I don't even remember. I know I placed some calls to people. I don't know to who and what I said, but I remember my sister showing up and on the way home, uh, I was gripping the seatbelt in her car. And I said to her, I don't know how I'm going to survive this. I don't even know if I'm going to go down into a dark hole. I, I don't know what I'm going to do with this. And she couldn't say anything to that. Um, other than to try to reassure me that, that, you know, she was going to be there with me so that I didn't. Um, and the next day my house filled up with family and friends and all of them came up to me to look me in the eye to make sure that I was telling the truth because they wanted some sort of glimmer of hope that this wasn't true, but it was. And so the next five days was about spending time with family and friends and, and, uh, an emotional roller coaster up and down and trying to figure out how I was going to even get through this. And um, when we got to Zoe's wake at the end of the week, there were over 500 people, sorry, 900 people that came. I couldn't believe it. I, I have, I couldn't, I would have stayed there another five hours uh, if more people came because I was so grateful of the impact that Zoe had in other people's lives. And Afterwards, I started to receive a bunch of handwritten letters from her friends who would tell me how much she impacted them, inspired them, and gave them hope, and to tell me that they were sorry for my loss, that I was sorry for their loss, because I knew we were all going to be missing. And I learned so much about myself through Zoe. Um, I didn't live through her. I, I simply observed. And what she was doing uh, for her friends and for people that she didn't know was all about impact. And I couldn't be more proud of the person that she was. Um, and I'm still connected to all of her friends and I'm so proud of them because it, it's a challenge. Um, and if teens today are just facing so many challenges and, and I wanted them to know that there are always options for them uh, that don't include uh, this option that Zoe decided on. And, and um, I'm just so proud of them because collectively they remind me of her. And, and, uh, and that's, that's kind of led me to doing this work that I do right now uh, to help people get up from sudden setbacks. I want to just thank you for sharing this story because uh, it's probably a story you've told many times and mm. I've read it a couple Mm. And it still like just lands in your heart. Mm. Um, so for the people who are listening, there's a lot of people right now who are really struggling with that idea of getting back up. Yes, you know? and, yes. and I'm grateful that you share that you were in that spot because, you know, sometimes after people have gone through a long healing journey and they've done their work and on, they're like, oh, I'm fine. I've, or not fine. I mean, fine's not the right word, but you've, you've, you've survived and are even thriving. And that's something you yeah. talk about in the book. Yes. It, it's, I think, helpful for people to know who aren't feeling that way today, mm -hmm. that we're offering this as like a beacon of light. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I think that what I found in my journey over the last seven and a half years is that 
when I was looking for guidance, I didn't know where to turn to. Um, I expected that time was going to heal all wounds. And if you, I'm sure you heard that as a kid too. Oh, time everybody, heals. yeah, that's, right. I mean, it's, it's an old it's adage, a right? a great that just, platitude that has absolutely no <laughs> bearing in science. I, the listeners of this podcast have heard me say this, but I, I, yeah. I can't help myself. One of my colleagues, Dr. Robert Niemeyer, did the research. Time accounts for 1% of your healing. Yes, and that, <laughs> that, I appreciate that. That's a fantastic, um, that's a fantastic, uh, I guess, fact and data point to, to recognize here. I believe that time is a companion, not the driver. And I think I've surrendered my healing and other setbacks in my life to time. And I've waited and waited and waited, and it didn't show up for me the way I needed it to. And so I believe that when we are going through a loss of a loved one, we do have to survive first but resources out there right now are focused on survival being the end game. And even if you get to that point, you're on your own after that. And so I feel like you have to survive first, then you can start to get back up and have some of those better days or better moments. And those become consistent. And then you can start exploring what's next. And eventually you can live beyond your loss. And I don't think it's fair to say, Hey, just, you know, it, it, you know, it's been two months. Why aren't you better yet? You know, it's, it's, it takes time and everybody's different. There's no timeline for this. There's no one right way to get through your own grief journey. And this is a journey we'll be on for the rest of our days. Um, but I do believe that there are folks that can walk with you on this journey. Uh, your podcast being one of them, Heather, where you're giving those, there could be one nugget that somebody hears on a podcast episode that just changes their entire day. And I love it when that happens. I love it when that happens because that gives somebody just that little nudge they need to just keep on going. Um, even when they don't think that they have the strength to do so. That reminds me of um, a quote from your book and I'm not going to quote it cause I'm going to totally mess it up, but I posted it on Instagram this morning cause it, it landed with me. I'm a knitter. <laughs> so okay. I work with yarn a lot. I, mm. I have problems sometimes with <laughs> string, you know, especially if I'm working with multiple colors. Mm. So I love anything, you know, string related. Okay, good. Um, so you, you compare tr like traumatic or difficult moments in our life to kind of having a pile of of tangled string, mm -hmm. tangled yarn right. in my world. Yes. Um, and how we have a tendency, and I'm one of these people, and I imagine a lot of listeners are too, where you see the big knotted messy pile and you're like, I got to fix all this right now. Mm -hmm. And anyone who's had a tangled necklace or tangled string, you know, if you go in and you just, you go for it, you start right. pulling at it, it gets mm -hmm. worse. Mm-hmm. So can you talk to us about, you know, your suggested approach, which I think is much, much more mindful and, and uh, probably has a better outcome. I appreciate that. And I, I, yeah, I think that when you're looking at this uh, grief as a pile of knotted string, um, if you, like you said, if you pull it, it's just going to create knots inside of that pile that are going to be really, really difficult to undo if you can undo them at all. And so if it gets too knotted, you might just leave it there. And that is being stuck, I think, in survival mode. And so just like with anything else that we have to deal with in life, we can't have all of the steps figured out at once. The only thing we can do is just take one step at a time and focus on the next step that's in front of us. And so when you're when you're trying to untangle this pile of string, you have to be very careful about what you're pulling and how you're moving it and how you're moving through this. That's not to say that you just stop and, and don't figure it out. It's just meant that you have to go slower and really look at how this string is is currently uh, in that pile. And, and how you can slowly uh, take one inch at a time of that string and, and untangle it from whatever knot is maybe starting to form and continue on until you do have a finely combed out um, uh, a string that is, is, is your grief journey. 
And if you notice any journey in life, uh, we always think that something is success. Uh, it's like success is just like, okay, well, this person is successful. They're there. And I don't know how I can get there, but their journey and anybody else's journey of success has a similar, uh, a parallel structure to this pile of string, right? They have to figure it out step by step or inch by inch. And, but what's on the other side of that is your, your, your goal, whatever that may be, you know, maybe your goal is to just survive your loss. That's okay. Maybe your goal is to have better days and maybe your goal is to live beyond the loss so that you're truly thriving um, and, and doing things that not only honor your loved one, but they honor yourself too, because you're important just as much. One of the things that I get from you, from your book, is you often see yourself through Zoe's eyes. Yes. Yeah, she's a gentle soul. Um, she cares about others. Uh, if you didn't have a deep connection with her, she didn't want to be near you. Um, and it's not because she was being mean or snooty. She just, she just thrived on deep connection. And when Zoe was hospitalized, uh, I would go and visit her often and she would introduce me to the staff or her friends and even the doctors and say, this is my dad, you know, and, and, Every time I go back, she'd be like, hey, Zoe's dad, you know, and and they still greet me to this day like that. And so um, I, you know, as a parent, you want your best. You want you want to do your best for your children. You don't want them to be in pain. But when you see who they truly are in the toughest of times, that's when their character is fully revealed. And the picture I have of Zoe is that she was just this giving person and that she was connected to so many people and she just exuded love and support. And, and that was so important to these kids who were struggling, some of them for the first time going to the hospital um, and the way she would show up for them and introduce herself and say, it's not that bad here. The staff is okay. And, you know, we're going to get through this, but you know, I'm Zoe, you know, and, and, oh, okay, cool. Maybe it's not going to be that bad. And so I just am so proud of her for that because I didn't, have any, I didn't give her any formal training on that. I just, this is just who she was at her core. And so she learned a lot of the socialization of, and being friendly with people from her mom. Um, I'm more introverted. <laughs> and so, but, but in how I connect with people is very similar to, to how Zoe was. So um, again, I couldn't be more proud of who she, you know, who she is. So. And I'm thinking the the qualities you listed off of her when she was, you know, in the inpatient or in the yes. halfway house. They're the qualities, and and just take this. They're the qualities you're exuding. Mm. You know, they're the qualities that you're giving back. And I think that's where the thriving comes in because thrive yeah. is such a tricky word in grief. Like it is. I mean, I've been doing this for a very long time. Mm -hmm. I mean, at least in my in my years, I think it's been about twenty, mm. and I've seen people you know, transform from the worst day of their life. Yes. Horrific story. Mm -hmm. And over, I liked how you said time is in, is in the passenger seat, but it's not the driver. It's a, or whatever. It, yeah. It's a well, companion. You said that, it's a companion, yeah. but not the driver, right. you know, with the companion of time and doing their work. Yes. Where they're, and it, it doesn't have to be like starting a foundation or going on a speaking no, tour. No. It could just be living your best life, whatever that is, yeah, yeah. If, you know, whatever it is for you. Mm -hmm. Now that's, you know, looking from the outside in, that's me telling people that right now that it's possible, but that can, that's like a concept that might not land in the emotional body when right. you're really raw and you're really hurt. And I'm thinking of the people right now who are going through grief in the pandemic, which mm -hmm. is extra um, challenged because of that inability to physically connect right? Uh, uh, in the same way with the people, like having that house mm -hmm. full of people and that, right. that kind of thing. Right. Um, and so what I think I would love for us to do, or you to do rather, <laughs> um, in your book, you, you do have some really good practical things that you did for yourself, Yes, you know, that might 
that might land with some of the people. And the first one I'm thinking of is your acronym that starts with mindfulness. Yes. We are on the Mindfulness and Grief podcast. I know that you are a meditator now, which is excellent. (laughs) And so when I'm reading the book and I see that your first thing was mindfulness, I was like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so can you talk to us about your acronym and the steps and maybe if if it's possible, kind of give an example? Sure. Um, so the acronym is called MAPS, and I feel like we need a map through our grief. And it does begin with mindfulness that, um, you know, paying attention to our own awareness. It's being aware of our own awareness. And so the more that we can be in tune with that, the more that we can look at the situation or the struggle or the the challenge that we're we're facing uh, in our grief with a little bit more clarity and and compassion for ourselves. Um, It is so easy to just get mired in uh, self-loathing and beating yourself up. Um, But that's what is that? That's not doing anything to help you. So in, in when we are talking about our self narrative, it's either hurting or it's helping you. And you can do you can do one of the other. You can't do both. And so I feel as though you have to really be careful about, you know, how you're treating that warrior within, you know, and, and I've seen some quotes, uh, you know, be careful what you say to yourself because the warrior within is listening. And so if you keep on, you know, you can you can. It is OK for you to figure this out. And so being mindful of your own self care and what you need is going to be really important. I think the A then steps into the approach that you take. Maybe an approach that you're taking with this is not working. It's like trying to, uh, it's trying to uh, do something that is going to make a difference, but you're just getting the same result over and over again. It's like what Einstein said, you know, it's the definition of insanity. So sometimes you have to take a different approach. What I like to do often is if somebody's struggling with something and they feel, let's say they feel guilty because their, you know, their loved one isn't here and they miss them so much, they feel like they were responsible for the loss in some way. I often remind them and ask them to think about if the situation was reversed. What if you were in their shoes and you weren't here? And they were, would you want them to be happy? And almost always they say, yes, I would. And so when we take up, think about a different approach to the, to the issue or the challenge that we're facing in our grief, we often can find a solution to that. The next is to predict, and that is predict the outcome that you want. It's okay to do that. It's okay to say to yourself, I want to feel better. It's okay to say to yourself, I want to have a better hour tomorrow or one hour where I'm okay. It's okay to say to yourself, I would like to have a good two days of solid, you know, uh, of feeling okay. And so if you can predict that outcome, you're going to start working towards that. And then I think the the S, it's not I think, the S means, (laughs) uh, it it means to embrace the suck. It means that, look, this is going to be so challenging that it's not going to be easy, but anything you want in life is uphill. And so if you've ever worked for something really, really hard in life and you've achieved it, you, it didn't get there by ease. It got there through hard work and grief is probably one of the hardest uh, journeys that you are ever going to have to walk on as, as a, you know, while you're here on this planet. And so we just have to be very, uh, mindful and, uh, the, and the approach that we take, we have to predict the outcome and we just have to embrace the suck of the, of the challenge and you will get through it and you will get through it. So there's a lot of balance in this because there's aspiration and hope, but there's not an avoidance or denial Mm -hmm. that this is really hard. Yes. Like in times it can seem insurmountable. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's a a lot of, um, I hope at least that there's more emphasis these days on allowing feelings, you Mm -hmm. know, on allowing people to say this, I don't want this to be happening. This is not what I wanted, you know, that, but I also think we need that balance. Yes. 
um, that balance of saying just the fact that you're listening to this podcast, by the way, means mm-hmm. that you're doing something. Exactly. Because I'll often have people not not often, but occasionally someone in a private session or group, they'll just be like, you know, I'm, I'm not doing anything for myself or I don't I don't know what to do or mm-hmm. I don't even want to feel better. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, you're you've there's a part of you that does. Sure. Because you've shown up. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, and so I just want yeah. to congratulate everybody who's listening. Yes. For yes, showing yes. up because sometimes that's the first step. It is. It is. And I, I, I love that you're pointing that out. Um, and I think that when you're really struggling, it's hard to see some of those things. And I would just also like to add to any of your listeners that uh, it is okay to figure this out and to give yourself that permission uh, to... Uh, figure things out. And if you don't think that things are going the way they're supposed to be going, that is the path. That is the path, whether it takes longer or shorter periods of time for you to, to get to certain milestones on your journey. Um, it, you are doing something about it by listening to podcasts, by joining groups, by even commenting how you're feeling in the moment is doing something. You are metabolizing your grief every single day, whether you think about it or not. Absolutely. I'm thinking about your storytelling role. Yes. You know, one of the things I really enjoyed about your book, and I'm not trying to give spoilers or, <laughs> you know, but it's like, I want to, I want to share how much I love it without giving things away, but but I, just to kind of travel back in time. So you yes. had a really unthinkable thing happen. Mm -hmm. What was it like to tell that story for the Mm. first time? Mm. You know, I'm I'm thinking of the first time you shared it, maybe to your, your speaking coach or maybe on a stage, because that's something that in the early acute period of grief, no one thinks about. And so Mm -hmm. again, if you're listening and you're like, this just happened, don't worry about doing this. It's I'm right, not saying right. you have to, but mm-hmm. some people get a lot of fulfillment, but through sharing their story and offering Correct. hope to other people. Right. So what was it like the first time you shared that? Scary as hell. Yeah. Um, and I, it, it's, it, there's a funny part of this is that uh, when I went to this first storytelling workshop, I knew I wanted to talk about my experience of navigating this grief with Zoe and uh, the story coach, his name is Bo Eason. He shared with me uh, and asked us to talk about a time when we were between the ages of nine and 14 that were pivotal moments. That's typically when your pivotal moment happened. And I'm thinking, well, I don't really know if I had anything that happened at nine between nine and 14 that was pivotal in my life at the time. But all right, well, I'll entertain this. And that was going to be the story that we worked on for the entire workshop. Well, the only story that I could come up with was that I had a crush on a girl in the sixth grade. And one day I sat next to her in the lunchroom and I emptied out my lunch bag and there was a devil dog. I don't know if you remember those. They're made by <laughs> Drake's, right? I don't, I don't well, know if, I don't, do they still make those? I don't know, but I, I, I remember what they taste like Ooh. now and I'm thinking about it, right? But uh, uh, it was like a whoopie pie with, but it was more like, a, it looked like a hot dog. Anyway, so this girl picks up my devil dog and just squishes it in her hands. And even though I had a crush on her, I told on her. And she got in trouble and she didn't speak to me ever again. Um, Now, fast forward to the end of that day, I was really upset about, you know, that story because that's, it just, it it wasn't landing with me. It just didn't sound right. And so at the end of the day, I found one of the story coaches there and I stopped him. I said, Hey man, I got a question for you. I don't really, I'm not really sure about my story. He's like, okay, tell me what, what it is. And I told him, you know, the girl and the, the devil dog and crushing and detention and all that. He's like, mm, okay, what else you got? Well, I said, my 15 year old daughter, Zoe died by suicide a couple of years ago. He's like, dude, dude, that's your story. And I don't know that, that he gave me permission at that moment, uh, 
to, to go back and, and make that my story. And it really was something that I wanted to do. I just didn't, I don't know. I was somehow resisting doing it. And that night I went back to the hotel and, uh, fell asleep cause I was just exhausted from the course itself. But then at midnight I woke up cause I was tossing and turning and I just started writing from that moment. I walked into the hospital, um, up until that, that point. So three hours later, I had about 25 pages of, of words that I had written. And the next day we got to share a, uh, what we call the one true sentence of our story. And there's 120 people in this room and you're doing this from the stage. And so I get up on the stage and I said, when I lost my 15 year old daughter, Zoe to suicide 24 months ago, I didn't know how or what I was going to do, except that I was going to fight for my family and all of Zoe's friends to find our better days. And it was silence in the room. And my story coach, he's like, stay there, don't move. You know, he's like, feel it, let it sink in. And I mean, you could hear just the air conditioning in the room. Um, and afterwards, uh, he made an offer for us to come work with him and to build the story from that one true sentence and let it become the story. And that's really the origins of my story. And that became a TEDx talk that became the book that became, which is now my online course that I'm developing. I mean, there's so many things that have derived from that one true sentence and it's all to help other people who are struggling to find their way through this horrible part of, a, of the human existence. When people are going through grief in the early, I say early period, that could be, who knows? Sure. What is time? Right. Um, <laughs> it's a companion, right? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great healer. Yeah. Said yeah. No grieving person ever. Right. <laughs> um, I, I was thinking about how in the early days, weeks, months, that time thing again, um, there can be a fear of letting go of the pain because mm -hmm. it feels like a betrayal or it feels yeah. like you'll forget or mm -hmm. it feels like you're somehow um, no longer honoring right. the love. Mm -hmm. But there's a shift that happens. Yes. And I imagine telling your story probably created a big shift for you. Mm -hmm. um, maybe could you talk to us about your experience of how that how that kind of changes from where you're afraid to let go of mm. the pain to, to, yeah. um, I almost want to say like, like releasing the resistance. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a it. fantastic way to, to say that Heather. Um, you know, this actually, I had probably one of the biggest epiphanies of this journey just two years ago. Um, I had moved from Massachusetts up to Maine, and I was living in a, an area, I was living along the coast of Maine, which I absolutely loved. I had uh, ocean front door, ocean out the back door. And I was just so grateful to be there. But I felt really bad because I had sold the house that Zoe lived in and I lived in for five years after she died. And then when I cleared out her room, um, it took me two days and about three boxes of tissues to go through everything, right? And I didn't throw, I, I didn't throw anything away. I, I packed some things up. I gave some things away. Um, but I was just really, really missing Zoe by being up in Maine. I couldn't go up to her bedroom and sit on her bed and look around at her, her you know, her and her universe any longer. And so I spoke with another mentor. Her name is Brandy. And I couldn't even, I could barely even talk. I was just, you know, weepy. And, and I'm like, this is six years later. What is going on? And so she said, Eric, um, what does it mean to let Zoe go? Oh, Heather, I got so angry when she said that. I said, I, I couldn't even answer the question. I'm like, what do you mean let her go? I, I, she's like, no, to bear with, work with me here. I, what does it mean to let Zoe go? And I couldn't talk. 
I couldn't talk at all. And when I finally was able to mutter some words, I said it would feel like there's a massive gap there. And she's like, Eric, I know you can hear this. And I'm saying this from a place of love. The gap already exists. I'm like, oh. But then she quickly followed up with, what does it feel like when you're filling that gap with the things that uh, you're helping other people with, like speaking and training and coaching and writing and all those other things? And, and I said, it feels fantastic because I feel like I'm honoring Zoe. She's like, that's it. That's it. See, we... Letting go doesn't mean that you forget who they are. It means that you're letting go of uh, your pain and your release, as you said, Heather, right? It's a release of resistance. You're never going to forget your loved one. And you can both honor them and live your life at the same time. And I don't know if many people realize that. You never fully let go of the person. You just let go of that resistance, like you said. I think there's a point where some people realize they've assimilated the story. It's a mm -hmm. word we like to use in thanatology, yeah. <laughs> you know, where it's it's maybe the word is infused, you know, where mm -hmm. where the the story of their loss mm -hmm. and the story of their life, right, are infused into your story, mm -hmm. and at some point through a lot of work, <laughs> a lot of different practices, sprinkle 1% time into the <laughs> recipe. Um, Just a dash. Yeah, yeah, the love remains. It makes me think of Rabbi, Rabbi Leader, who I interviewed a couple episodes ago, mm -hmm. Beauty of What Remains. Yes. You know, that's what it's about. Is Yes. And that doesn't mean that you don't still hurt sometimes and you don't sure. still cry sometimes yeah, and you right. don't still rage against it. It's right. not like you've ticked a box and... Now you're right. this mm -hmm. much more complex than that. It is. It is. How have you found your own ways of letting go? Oh, well, mindfulness is mindfulness mm -hmm. and yoga and writing. Mm. You know, that's I accidentally found my way of letting go <laughs> um, okay. because I got I didn't I didn't really realize I hadn't. I don't want to say I hadn't processed my uncle's death, but, you know, I was a kid and, and, and you always revisit loss throughout your lifespan, throughout mm -hmm. different times in your life and in different journeys. And I think my grief over Doug's death, it got interrupted. It got interrupted when I was a teenager. And mm -hmm. I've mentioned this on the last podcast, so I'm not trying to drive this home, but my journals were thrown away, oh. which stopped my grief work. Gotcha. Teenager. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it just kind of, I think, hibernated in me. Mm -hmm. And then I, I got diagnosed with a stress-related illness called shingles, which is mm -hmm. not fun. And my nurse practitioner told me I needed to get a grip on my stress. I needed to stop drinking. Mm -hmm. I was in my 30s. I drank a lot. Mm -hmm. um, probably to deal with that stress I didn't want to sure. deal with, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and she told me to go try yoga. Mm. And so I went and tried yoga and holy Moses, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, all of a sudden, you know, I, I felt, I felt stable, more stable than I'd felt yes. in a while. Yeah. And it was at a, a retreat at Kripalu up in your old neck of the woods up in Massachusetts. Uh -huh. It was my first yoga retreat and the grief I had my arms up in the air. We were, we were told to stand in mountain pose for as long as we could. That was oh, the wow. practice. So, okay. you wow. know, I don't know how long she had planned, but mm -hmm. everybody in the room, arms up in the air. Mm -hmm. It's also probably worth mentioning that this is three weeks after 9-11 mm. and that there are people in the room who'd lost family and coworkers who oh, had wow. already been signed up for this. Okay. Um, standing there with my arms in the air, just, you know, real strong position, right? Mm -hmm. Something just cracked. Mm. Like, it's almost like it was so brittle. It just, and all the grief of my uncle's death, of some dog's death, of my parents' divorce, like all this mm -hmm. stuff that I just suppressed. Mm -hmm. But 
it was both like you can you can see my face right now. Other people yeah. can't. This face that I have, it's kind of like I've tasted battery acid, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's it's but it was when it was over, it was such a relief. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm not saying that was the end of processing it. I no. then within a matter of a year and a half started volunteering on a suicide hotline mm, nice. in honor of my right. uncle Doug. Right. So nice. that's you know, it was it was an accidental awakening brought yeah. on by an illness. It's it's like you pulled the cork on it. Yeah. You know, on it and and there's a flood of emotions that go along with that. And I'm glad you had some people in the room that could be there to, to catch you, you know, and to be with you because, um, and I think that's also scary for folks because they're, uh, they don't know if there's anybody really that's walking alongside of them on their journey who gets it and can be there to catch them if they fall, you know, or if, if they have that release and because what do you do with that, you know? And so, uh, I, I get my advice to somebody is if they are, if they have something to say, if they have something that they just want to release and get off their chest or, or process it to get with a coach, get with a therapist, get with a professional who can hold that space for you so that you have that um, you're caught. Okay. You are, uh, you are, you are supported and you are able to process it appropriately. And, um, you know, it, 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 but I know that could be scary for some folks if they just don't even know where to go and where to start with all that. So. Well, we have a couple resources between you and I Mm. (laughs) for places people can start. You yes, know, and we'll talk about that in a, in a few moments. We'll talk about your course and, and what you offer. And it, I agree, it, it's scary to be vulnerable with someone. Yes. And I find in, in grief work that's different than a lot of other mental health genres, if that's the right thing to say. Yes. That it's helpful to have a coach or a therapist or someone who's gone through it themselves. And I'm a member of the Association of Death Education and Counseling. And mm. there isn't anyone in there that I know of who doesn't have their own life loss story. You know, and these yeah. are the researchers. These are the mm-hmm. academians. These are the hospice program directors and art therapists, music therapists, me. And we all have our own story. And so even though it's very different, Yes. Um, you know, my friend and I were talking about the idea of a grief expert and that's just kind of a kind of a <laughs> cringy word because it's like everybody's grief is unique and special because it's about the relationship you have with the person that died. Yeah, that I, so I call that a, a, a f- grief is like a fingerprint. It is your exactly fingerprint like it. is like mine and yours, yes. but each experience is unique to us. And that holds true for any setback that you have in life. You know, if you walk with somebody who has those scars, um, who has been on the journey, either if they're up ahead of you on the journey, they're the ones that can turn around and go, hey, watch out, this is coming you know, and, and show you what's up ahead and walk with you. And so you're right. It is, it is very unique to us. Um, but there is some, uh, wonderful truth in there that is also very beautiful. And I'm not talking about the grief being beautiful, beautiful, but your reemergence into your life, reconnection with love, um, reconnection with others that happens when you emerge from the abyss. Um, that is really important. And that, that is available to everybody who is on their journey. So what advice do you have for people who are, I, I want to ask you two advice questions. And okay. This can be very simple, very top level, because again, everybody's different. Sure. But someone who today is just listening to this and they're like, I just can't, I'm so mm-hmm. not there yet. I'm not mm-hmm. ready to thrive. What would what would you offer to them as maybe their next best step? Hmm. Um, I think the first thing is to maybe assess where they are on their journey. You know, is this has have you been struggling for a month, a year, ten years? I mean, there is there's no timeline for this, and so um, 
when you're able to start on this journey, I think it's to start and lay the foundation of your journey and understand what surviving means. But with a focus that you can get back up and that better days are coming. And so it, it, now if you're in the middle of the, of your journey in terms of you know, like, maybe I am having some better days. Well, maybe it, now it's time to start exploring what's next you know, with, with living beyond the loss, what does that mean to you? What do you, you know, what is your story and how can that potentially help you or others to heal? Um, what is it that you want to uh, do uh, with your, um, with your life moving forward, you know, but, but going back to the beginning pieces of it, if you're not really sure where to start, you're starting right now by listening to this podcast, you know, and, and, there's going to be an entry point for you onto the path that is going to be your own and you get to walk that sucker at your own pace not somebody else's you know if somebody says to you i have you know it's been six months aren't you over it yet uh yeah this is my journey not yours pal love you mean it but this that that's it has to be on your pace and that's okay so um, yeah, just, uh, I think there's just no timeline and there's no, and it's on your pace. And that might be the, a good time to reach out to a, and I, I did, I'm not belittling those of us who have focused our lives on grief by saying that we're grief expert and just saying expert sure. has a lot of weight. I sure. think we have to be kind of, um, we, we do have an expertise in that subject matter for sure. But mm-hmm. those who are in the field know that there isn't one right way. Right. And so finding someone that resonates with you mm-hmm. that can help help you assess where you are, mm-hmm. help you discern what do you want to work on next? Is yes. it getting back to sleep? Is it taking mm-hmm. care of your physical body? Mm-hmm. Is it spending some time in nature, giving yourself a break from all the pain and just taking in the beauty? Right. You know, what, what is the thing that's going to be right for you? And there's multitudes of things you could do. There is. There's always options. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And sometimes having a little extra support will help with that. Absolutely. And then um, for those people who are like, okay, I'm at, th- I'm at this point where I've worked through you know, uh, the intense emotions of grief Mm -hmm. where I'm ready to take the next step into creating a, um, a lifestyle where I can thrive and honor Mm -hmm. my loved ones. One way that they could go is into your course, which I want to give you some time to talk about that. When is it going to be? How do we find you? You could also read your book too, but if they wanted some <laughs> some connection with you. Well, I appreciate that, uh, Heather. I'm, you know, the course that I'm developing right now is called Surviving the Loss. And it's really about guiding you through the uh, first weeks and months of your loss, navigating survival mode. Because most people stay in survival mode. A few years ago, I did an online, I was in a, in a group with over 28,000 people on Facebook and I did a survey and I asked them, you know, where are you on your, in your, your grief right now? And 63% of the people that were polled said that they were merely surviving. Some were making, trying to make it to the next day and some to the next hour. And that number 63% just stuck with me. It has stuck with me for so long. And so uh, I wanted to put together a course that would help people to release those anchors of guilt and anything tethering them to their, um, uh, to their journey that keeps them stuck. And so, you know, it's, it's about getting your footing. It's about discovering your path, navigating the rough terrain, and then also the obstacles that might show up but then also building momentum so you can move through and out of survival mode. And then there's a focus on what's next and beyond when you're out of survival mode, that's where I think a lot of resources stop. And so we have to find those next things that are for us. Those better days can, can actually create clarity for you because you're coming out of the fog and now you've got that reconnection to life and to some 
other uh, areas that that you didn't think you would be reconnected to. And maybe you've made some new connections along the way, but it's starting to explore that and 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 build on that so that now you are in that mode of working towards honoring your loved one and yourself at the same time. Mm, it sounds wonderful. Because <laughs> the first step towards transformation is stabilization. Yes, right. And, and figuring out how to get through it. Correct, yes. So one more thing before we close out, and I kind of yes. waited till the end because people could be listening to this, you know, anytime during the year forever. Yes. As long as the internet is around. <laughs> um, but we are recording this a few weeks before Father's Day. Yes. And as a bereaved father, mm -hmm. do you have any suggestions for other grieving fathers out there who are listening to this about approaching that day? No, that's a great question. Um, it's always been a unique day for me. Um, I think the best advice would be to, when you wake up in the morning on Father's Day, uh, you may be emotional. You may not want to get out of bed. You may not want to do anything. But if you put your feet on the floor, you get dressed, and you go do something that, uh, for yourself that would you know, be good, it's okay, and you do honor your loved one. And I, I placed myself in Zoe's shoes and I said, well, what if I wasn't here uh, and Zoe was? Would I want her to be sad on Father's Day? And I, I wouldn't, I would want her to have as good of a day as possible. And so I believe Zoe wants me to do the same. And so I have found a way to plan an event, even if it's for a couple of hours to go out, maybe I'll go to a restaurant. I used to, when the girls were little, I took them down to Louisiana <clears throat> to visit a friend. And uh, when we got off the plane, I said, guys, you got to go to Waffle House. You got to try this. This is so, so good. And they're like, oh yeah, yeah. That's like another, I said, no, no. So we walk in and the girls were just, oh, they were so amazed. They were just looking around. They didn't say a word. And we ordered everything on the menu, you know, biscuits and gravy and eggs. And this is great, Dad, you know. And so that's the kind of thing that I'm not saying I'm going to Waffle House on Father's Day right now. But all I'm saying but it could is happen. that <laughs> but it could happen. Or maybe I will go to a breakfast place mm -hmm. or maybe I'll have breakfast. You know, I mean, something that is is brings a smile to your face because it's OK. And, and I think for guys too, because a lot of times I think guys feel like we just can't, we can't show emotion uh, because we have to be strong. There is no weakness in showing emotion. It is actually a strength because you're human. You're not a machine. Um, you are wired like everybody else on this planet and that you are emotional. And so finding a way to be okay with that. And if you are struggling with that, then, then talk with somebody who can help you explore what that looks like for you. It doesn't mean that you're going to break down and cry for, you know, three days straight. Um, it may, but it, it, it could also mean that you just want to express yourself in a very creative way to honor your loved one. And, and that could be an emotional, you know, maybe you like to write, like you talk about writing, Heather. Um, there is a, a catharsis and a release of emotion that comes with writing. And so that might be something that a dad can do on Father's Day. You know, write a letter to your, to your child. Um, write a letter to your child and tell them how much you love them and miss them and that you're proud of them. And believe me, that will be, that will go, um, you don't have to send it, of course, where you're going to send it, but you know, it, it but the, uh, the act of doing that, it, it does connect you, um, to your, to who you are as a person and it's okay. Mm. That is beautiful advice for us to end on. And I think it will <laughs> land in the heart of many fathers and mothers. That's good advice for anyone, really any loss yeah. you've had, but I think hearing it from from father to father is, is important and special. Yeah, yes. So where do we go to find you and where do we go to find your book? Well, I appreciate that. Um, I have a gift for your audience because um, I'm just grateful for them listening. And so if they go to griefsurvival.guide, um, I have put together an ebook 
about with eight essential tools to help them survive uh, a loss in the early days and weeks. And so that's a free gift. All they have to do is just, um, you know, enter their uh, their name and email and I'll send it to them for free. And so um, I'd love to be able to give that to your to your audience um, as just gratitude for listening uh, today. And uh, to get my book, you can go to um, Zoe's story dot com. And I can send you the link as well so that you can have that in the show notes, but uh, that's the quickest way, or you can find it on Amazon. It's a Sherpa named Zoe and uh, Z O I is how her name is spelled. And it is a wonderful book. I think it would be a good read for anyone, no matter where they are on their grief journey. I'm reading it um, outside of acute grief. You know, my Mm -hmm. last, my last major loss was, actually uh, a week ago mm. uh, in we're in 2021 my stepdad died a week ago in 2009 and then wow. our dog died today in 2009 a week after wow. him that was mm. sorry to hear uh, that that was rough um, yeah. and so I've been emotional this week mm. you know I it, it just it's, grief is one of those things you don't have to know the date even but the right. the way the sun shines and the air smells and mm-hmm. the heat that that lands in you but i i read your book both as a podcast interviewer but i also read it as someone with loss mm. thank and you i think it it was there's a lot i love about it i love that you're very spacious and and you offer guidance without being um, a dictator. <laughs> mm. If that, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's beautiful. And I highly recommend this book. So uh, go again, say the website again, we'll have it on the show notes, but the website for the free download, the free is a uh, grief uh, survival dot guide. Okay. So do that and then go yes. get a Sherpa, Sherpa named Zoe, Z O I at Amazon. <laughs> and you will have two great guides for your grief journey. So perfect. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Heather. This has been wonderful, a great conversation, and uh, I'm grateful to you and your audience, and and, uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Eric. I am very grateful that you spent this time with me. I will always remember it. Awesome. Me too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Mindfulness and Grief Podcast. Please help us spread the word and subscribe to this podcast or even write a review. A special thank you goes to our podcast engineer, Todd Campbell of Hub City Recording, and to the Atomic Mosquitoes who provide our theme music. This podcast is a service of the Mindfulness and Grief Institute. Visit us at mindfulnessandgrief.com to download your free copy of Navigating Grief and to learn more about our Awaken Meditation for Grief group and one-on-one support. I am your host, Heather Stang. May you find some peace in knowing you are not alone. And please be gentle with your grieving heart as you move through the rest of your day.